the topic for this, but I would like to bring in some other questions if there are, but we'll just start with the headline topic. Um, you know, selling the vision. I hope, I hope you've been able to see over the course of the day that there is something real happening here. But undoubtedly, it's still hard to sell this idea to um, you know, uh, potential purchasers or certainly national bodies who don't quite get it. So maybe if you could start with you, Emily, any thoughts about how we, how we sell this better? Because we think there's something special happening here. When we think about selling something or um, maybe making a business case to adopt a particular system, framework, methodology, what have you, we often focus on the cost and the benefit and the risk of that thing. Um, and we build business cases around it. But I think uh, what we need to start doing more of is focusing on the cost and the risk of inaction uh, and the opportunity cost that we have from continuing with these methods that we know don't provide a big return on investment and we know leave out so much of the data and um, elements of healthcare that we need to include. So that's one thought. And then another is to just know the market really well, stay up to date with the big vendors and the new vendors and how their product roadmap is playing out and what functionality they're bringing to the table because um, it can often surprise you. Okay, um, when I think about the CIOs that I talk to on a daily basis, um, it often is a case of uh, understanding the value proposition of that particular region or uh, entity that you're dealing with. And I think, you know, when we talk about the electronic health record, in some markets, that's, that's pretty much saturated. So I think, uh, your, you know, a strategy for, for selling the value proposition of this, of this capability would, would work better in certain regions. Those regions that are particularly wanting to build more than just EMRs, that they're looking to build new capabilities around analytics, uh, potentially, you know, where you've got regions like the STP regions in the UK, where they're trying to connect the dots between health systems. So I think, the, for me, the value proposition of having connected health records across organizations with an ability to leverage that data for analytical purposes, precision healthcare, uh, you know, research into artificial intelligence on the data, those, those kind of capabilities are what will sell it. So it's not just about, for, uh, whilst the data is absolutely important, it's not just about focusing on the, the nature of the data, it's focusing on those additional applications that can be brought to bear upon that. Yep, um, Andrew Forrest uh, from Taunton. I think, uh, building on that, I think there is a real opportunity at the moment with the change towards SDPs and ICSs and the move to share data and move away from the monolithic systems and just being able to access the data freely, that there's a chance to sell examples and best practice to different areas about how things can be different using this different methodology. Um. Just um, last week, I was uh, with uh, with Mike at at the Gardner conference, and uh, I talked to an analyst, uh, an American analyst, and uh, I explained this story to him, open data and all this, and he said, "So, what's the business case for open data?" And that got me thinking. That's why we have this question today, and I think it is really tough because. Uh, as Emily mentioned, if you compare it to existing solutions which have a clear, uh, I think you call it benefits realization here, uh, it's, it's impossible. So this was one part. And the other part was uh, I talked to a, a class uh, a representative, and class regularly ranks uh, how consumers or, or customers see EHR uh, systems. And of course, Epic comes always on top. And I asked them, have you ever done a price performance analysis? Not just, uh, you know, which one comes on top, and they have not. So I think, you know, we need to take uh, that into account, and we definitely need to look at, uh, at uh, how the systems that are being put in place are performing, and what is the alternative. And I think if we look at it like that, I mean, Celia just today mentioned that uh, a region in Norway is spending 1.1 billion euros for an EHR for about a million patients? Less. Less than a million patients, right? So how can you do a benefits realization for a billion euros to put in an EHR for less than a million patients? That would be a real challenge, I think. So you know, we need to understand how that works and uh, at the same time build a business case. So we as a company, what we've come to learn is that it's usually much easier to sell an application uh, than to sell the platform. 
And uh, the reason is that it's comparable. People understand what they're buying, and especially NHS procurement uh, has a much easier time buying something they've always bought. So this is one way in. Uh, selling the platform up front uh, is, is really, really a hard task. So obviously, where there's um, a tender that asks for a platform and understands the differences, it's much easier. But the procurements we see, um, that's not the case. Taking a slightly different viewpoint, the, I was asking my colleagues about how like, open air and open platforms became a thing in Scotland even before what we're doing now. And I know that so Ewan um, from Aperta and, and uh, Tony from the Ripple Foundation came and spoke to our clinical change leadership group around open platforms and open data. And, and it's been that clinical leadership that's driven a lot of the appetite for this such that other things needed to happen as well, so government need to be on board, and there's people from civil service, such as Jeff Huggins, who been really want to do things in a different way and to have a different delivery model. And we, you know, we, you know, we, when you look at things, you see that if every sim system is implementing the same stuff over and over again, we end up the systems paying for the same thing to be done hundreds of times, as well as earlier SMEs talking about undifferentiated work doing, implementing the same things again and again. So there's obvious economies, but even with that clinical leadership and the, and the political drive and the civil service, there's our appetite to do things differently. Then the only way we can really validate it is by actually delivering. So as an organization, we've been very focused on actually just getting something simple out there in front of people, people seeing the value. Then, then the sort of arguments end and people think about where, how they could actually use this to improve their own workflows. Um, I'm not a salesperson, uh, but I like to focus on, on the opportunities to create clinical functionality that not a, only actually answers the, the um, um, requirements that the, the clinicians have in when they first procure these solutions, but it also has the ability to change as clinical practice changes. Uh, which is something that we're not really getting from, from legacy systems at the moment. Another uh, thing is, of course, that as a healthcare service, at least in Norway, we're required to keep the patient's information and being able to access them from before they're born till after they're dead, which is much more than the uh, lifespan of one system. So being able to keep the data and being able to know what, it's, uh, what it looks like, how we can use it, um, across a series of system, uh, systems is, is another, I think, uh, major um, uh, issue that we we're able to solve using this approach that we don't have in, in existing legacy. Yeah, I guess um, I completely agree with what said before. I think it, it is challenging for people. Um, it's hard to think that there might be a different way of doing this. I'm actually building systems in a different way. And I... The phrase I use now is, is this is an evil, it's, sorry, this is a revolution with a small r and a capital E, you know? It is a revolutionary different way of building systems, but it doesn't have to be deployed uh, and adopted in a revolutionary way. And, you know, Tamaj particularly talked about that postmodern approach, just let this thing grow it. It's a little bit like green energy, you know? Just set the seed, give permission, support. It doesn't have to be full-throated support, just let this thing grow. And it will morph and change. It may not be open EHR in 20 years. Um, it, the world will be different. But I think this way of building systems and supporting innovative developers, because trying to build a system from scratch is almost impossible. Um, you and my colleague will tell you that there's always been no new entrants to the market in the UK in the last 20 or 30 years that have grown beyond small SMEs. And that's not right for any, for any economy, uh, let alone a health economy. I'm going to open the floor to some questions or comments. So if any of you have things you'd like to contribute, Tom, you, you can get your chance to answer your question now. <laughs> well, uh, uh, the whole question of what's the blocker is, um, I think it's, it's to do with platform being a new paradigm. So a, a, par a paradigm change is like a, you know, a chemical or physical state change and the system hates it and resists it and then it happens, but it's kind of got to happen across the whole environment. And if you think about why things aren't working in the current environment, 
you know, there's all these factors that conspire to keep things the way they are. I think procurement's probably the biggest blocker because procurement's still working on some ancient model of, you know, risk aversion and just buying giant systems that, I mean, the cost doesn't matter as long as it looks like, you know, a similar previous purchase and this kind of thing. So um, the problem with the state change is that somehow all of the molecules in the brew have got to decide that they're going to become a steam instead of being water or, you know, whatever the particular state change is. And it's got to happen, not instantly all at once, but it's kind of got to break out naturally across the whole environment. Uh, the other big problem, I think, is that the benefits of platform and open data accrue in a much more sort of, like, over a longer time and also uh, to the patient more than to short-time episodic care delivery. So there's not such a big motivation to buy a, a, a category of solution to fix our you know, need for produ uh, providing care inside a hospital environment. And yet the whole of societies, if you kind of you could interview everybody and make them understand you know, what the value is, they'd, everybody would say, yes, let's do it. So why doesn't it happen? Well, my guess is, and you know, so this is a, maybe you could comment, um, there needs to be some sort of central guidance and potentially commitment to ideas of open platform like Scotland's doing and Norway's doing it at least to some extent and some places are doing it so I'm not saying this never happens. It doesn't happen very often though. What do people think about here in the UK and or other countries if anybody wants to comment? <laughs> Mike's prepared to give it a go. I think if you look at the, the, the global evidence, four out of five healthcare organisations that have purchased and implemented an EHR using a traditional vendor are still trying to get the value from that platform, okay? Um, and, you know, one in, I think one in eight hospitals is at HIMSS level seven or one in seven or something like that. So there's still a lot of value that's been left on the table from those systems. Even though they're, they cost a lot of money, they will deliver you a, a digitized set of transactions within a hospital environment, there's still a lot of value there. So the original business cases, you might argue, were perhaps overstated. Particularly in government-funded health systems, uh, the, the kind of case that these systems will help drive up revenue just, just doesn't work. You know, we can't, we can't continue to drive more and more revenue in, in a system that can't cope with that level of inflation. So, and all the while, technology has moved on. We're now into an era of virtual care and telehealth. Uh, precision healthcare may only be 10, 15 years away. Uh, um, you know, advanced population health analytics is, is the next kind of era that we're entering. So, I think there is an opportunity, and that opportunity is to say, you know, we've got to learn from the fact that these applications that we're put in have a, they have a pretty good developed code base. We've got some very nice looking applications out there. They have had a burden on productivity, but the real value that's left on the table from those systems that we can perhaps exploit in, in an open EHR movement is the value in the data. It's that insight, and it's creating uh, an, a, an area where you can then build on next, genera next waves of technology. So, so, for example, precision health, population health. And for me, it, it's, it's looking forward and saying, where might we be in five, 10 years' time? Let's plan for that future. And build the capabilities around that core open air environment that, we'll, we'll, that we need in the next five to 10 years, rather than be trying to still focus on maybe just a core electronic health record, um, which, is, which, which if we achieve that, we'll still, we still have the question of how do we get value from it. So it's, in some cases, it's treating the EHR as a commodity, and in, it's also then saying, how do we best leverage the data within that based on the future technologies that are coming. I think that's kind of where you need to set your sights is on that next five to 10 years. Yeah, and, and you know, even um, um, as you said in your presentation, you know, the world is moving f from the EHR to the next step, which is basically data and um, analytics applications around that data. And it's not clear that the EHR vendors will take up that space because the EHR is just one provider of data in this environment. And it's not even the biggest one. So I think you know the, the only way to disrupt this is by changing the game, and uh, you cannot go head to head as many have seen with these big vendors. And you know the theory of disruption is definitely not to attack them head on, but to change the game. And and the game is changing. Well, we we see this. Uh, you know it is not uh, well. Uh, somebody said that there. 
I think you said that there were now the last guys are buying these EHR mega suites, and uh, it depends on on which market. Uh, but uh, I, I would agree. Uh, so the next step is, uh, you know, we talked about this in the U.S. about companies which are taking advantage of this data and providing uh, analytics back to the trusts in terms of how to optimize what they're doing, how to uh, improve care. These are not EHRs anymore. These are analytical platforms that actually provide insight into the data, and they have to augment the EHR data with a lot of other stuff, including personal data and, uh, and uh, patient-generated data and so on. So this is, I think, a sweet spot because uh, as soon as you need to put disparate data together, you're basically normalizing it, and if you normalize it, I think open EHR is a really good choice. So you mentioned the need for almost a standard or an agreed approach, and that is absolutely the case. We need to be careful that we don't let it paralyze us. And I brought up New Zealand as an example in my presentation earlier. They have a, a national health information platform project. Um, but they haven't really started executing on it. They've been talking about it for five years because they have all these committees that are trying to make standards and they're trying to get their head around it. And by the time they come up with something that they're happy with, it's redundant because there are new standards that have been published and new technologies. Um, and so a better approach is to have a set of smaller or a smaller set of principles that you can then use to guide procurement. So for instance, any new system that we bring into this environment, the data that are collected needs to be extensible into an open platform so that we know that we can then have that platform to run particular analysis on. You might not even have that platform yet, but that's a principle um, that can guide procurement right now. Um, and there are those principles that have been published. Alistair, I think you talked about the, the idea of the MVP. So there is a starting point. Um, you just need to let it enable rather than paralyze. Any other questions? Manish, at the back. Oh, sorry. Beg your pardon. Hello. No. Yep, sorry. I'm interested in the concept of the decision maker. A, a, a number of you have mentioned this. Um, the people or persons making the decision to buy or to move towards open EHR. I mean, open EHR is a, it's a very long-term concept. You know, the benefits take some time to come through. Yet, there is a statistic that's stuck in my head. It's probably apocryphal, but the average tenure of a chief executive in an organization is about three and a half years in NHS. The average tenure of a health secretary is about 2.5 years. The average tenure of somebody in procurement is probably about one and a half years until they've done the next big job and moved on somewhere else. So, so where is the point of influence to get this lodged properly into the psyche of those people that really need to work with this across the health and care systems in the UK and elsewhere? I mean, uh, the UK obviously is, is one of the more complicated uh, markets. Uh, I like this uh, uh, example we have from Norway where actually the vendors uh, agreed to do this uh, probably out of fear, fear of, uh, of uh, the big American mega suites of, uh, of Epic in this case, and uh, came to the government and said, look, you know, we can build the software uh, and uh, you decide which models uh, we will use. And I know that countries like Norway have tried for 10, 20 years to standardize, and most, most have failed if they did this centrally, but with the vendors coming, and offering this as a possibility. Because the issue we have on the market now is not really whether this is a good idea or not, is where are the applications? We come to customers and they say, we love this idea, can I have a full EHR? And as you saw today, we are getting there. We, we're very close to having full EHRs uh, deployed in uh, referenceable sites uh, and be offered as a product in primary care in, in hospitals. And I think. This is the issue. You know, if you as a customer have this choice, have open data or not open data, it's not really tough to choose. Of course, again, we have to understand that the, uh, the large institutions, the university medical centers, will probably aspire to uh, the mega suites for some, some time, but that's only 10% of the market. The rest of the market neither has the money for that, nor can they, uh, can they procure such a, such a uh, huge project, and there is inherent risk involved, as we see in many examples. 
So I think that's the sweet spot, and uh, you know, finding uh, innovative uh, uh, CIOs like like uh, in in Taunton who are willing to bet uh, bet on this. It is a bet in the end. Take some courage, uh, and <laughs> just. <laughs> Also at, at Gartner, we had a presentation by Malcolm Gladwell, the, the famous author, and he has a new book, and, and, and he mentioned one thing which, which stru struck uh, me really uh, hard. He said that uh, the tank was invented by the British in the World War I and actually proved its value in one of the last battles. But it was not until 20 years later in World War II that another country, and this time Germany, actually mass-produced and used the tank. Why? Because after the war, they didn't know where to put it. It wasn't an infantry thing. It wasn't uh, with um, um, any other existing unit. So they couldn't create a new unit uh, fast enough to be ready for, for the Second World War. And this is why it took 20 years, even though it was quite obvious it was a better way of, of, uh, of uh, fighting. So I think uh, it's similar here, you know, who makes this decision? We need to influence many, many uh, decision makers in a trust because it's not just an IT solution. And, and actually, I think this is what we need to, uh, to do. Uh, the uh, CCIOs, the medical directors. The problem we are facing is probably mostly on the financial side. How do we uh, prove uh, the, how you call it, benefits realization of, of these technologies versus something that actually has a track record and uh, has uh, clear cases? Even I would argue that they are not clear cut in terms of the benefits. But at least it's what everybody else has done, and that, that means I probably can't be fired for that. Manish, you had a question? Oh, sorry, I'll no, that's fine. No, carry on. <laughs> no, so carry on. The, yeah. I, 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 so just on the decision maker thing, my slightly cheeky response is that whilst decision makers are short lived, the health IT systems we have last for 40 years. So uh, a decision may have some longevity. Um, but that's a slightly more serious point about momentum. So, you, so actually, we're in a lucky position that our ducks are in a row, everything's pulling in the right direction, but we, we have to deliver something and keep incrementing on that such there is a momentum, such that it isn't an easy decision to, to re revoke or change. And actually, the, but the organizations we've got inherently have a momentum. These are policies and standards groups and other things that will sort of keep things going for enough years that we can get enough sort of momentum ourselves around the product so that it will keep going. I absolutely agree with that point. If we look at the US market and the big changes that have happened there and what caused them, 2008, Obama passed the High Tech Act, incentivizing digitization according to meaningful use. That is absolutely what propelled the EHR market to begin with. More recently, the legislation requiring fire compatibility is now finally starting to see some more changes towards interoperability in the big vendors. And so it is less, I mean, it's very important to have your leadership team at a provider organization level aligned, but we can't forget about the influences from a policy point of view, because that's where the big change comes from. <laughs> Okay. Minish, sorry. sorry. Um, I think a lot of discussion here is about transition from product strategy to platform strategy for a lot of organizations. And I think, though there is a financial case, that the biggest challenges are cultural as well for a product-based organization to move to a platform-based organization. And a lot of platforms like Apple have offered things like SDK, application layers, and I think what I heard today is OpenHR is a lot about data layer. Um, is it worth considering more about application layers? Because the EHRs, let's be honest, to users are sold on their um, functionality and user interface. And a lot of time, the detail of open platform and open data is lost. Um, so is it worth considering for, for you as a strategy to think about how could you have a toolkit which creates application layer, which probably gives a, or, or a uh, app store for open EHR to give it more kind of, um, kind of strategy to get into the market? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, they're already, those products are starting to emerge. Um, you know, better have some tools. I saw some really interesting stuff a couple of weeks ago that I can't talk about. Um, 
and they're, you know, we've, we're working with a number of companies. Uh, and it's one of the, there's a parallel organization in Scotland called Digital Health and Care Institute, and we're hoping to be working them, with them very soon to do exactly that, to encourage SMEs to build additional tooling and to get up to speed in terms of delivering the applications that will sit on top of the platform. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because I think um, as we've been developing uh, our models ready to uh, put in the applications on top of the platform, it's when we're starting to see the excitement from the clinicians and some real interest in terms of some as they're being listened to and as we're, we're changing the uh, apps to really work the way they want them to work. So I think there is an opportunity there. It tells a much better story. <coughs> One more question, John, at the front. Do you want to say something? Um, I'd just like to put a perspective as a, I see myself as a scientist more than an engineer, uh, working in AI, but um, working for Cancer Research UK and, and at Oxford University and, and also time at the Royal Free and, and so on. And, and while we've been very preoccupied with trying to get this project called Open Clinical, which is very different from Open Air, has different objectives, but our history has been, in some ways, quite similar. It's been pushing a very large rock uphill uh, for a number of reasons, which I'm sure are similar to yours. Um, but as scientists, I think one of the things we've been very concerned about is evidence. Can we build, as we go along, we can do all this fancy academic theoretical work, mm. but can we build applications and deploy them, or at least demonstrate that we can improve clinical outcomes, clinical practice? Um, and recently, um, I, I kind of sat down and did a bit of a rummage around and looked at all the people who'd done studies and published, many of them published in mainstream journals, um, of applications. And they're about one a year over 20 years. And since I've had this kind of evidence base, it suddenly I felt that we actually got listened to. Mm -hmm. It's really kind of changed. Mm -hmm. um, before that, you know, sometimes I kind of tried to sell set it on the basis of, well, it's really kind of strong formal computer science, or it's uh, a variety of different things coming from a kind of scientific perspective, which nobody kind of really wanted to. They were interested in applications, as you were saying. They were not interested in, in grand, grand theories. Um, and I, my question is, to what extent have you kind of been paying attention to building evidence that open air can contribute to better outcomes, to better clinical practice in measurable ways? And do you think actually that's something that you need to do? I'll start. Um, <clears throat> it's really hard. Uh, and it's not, not, not for open air. I think it's just really hard to demonstrate the benefit of any EHR technology actually making a direct benefit. Lots of people have tried. Uh, the evidence is not that great. And yet, if I look at my own experience as a clinician going through the transition from paper to electronic, there is no way on earth we'd go back. And the, the amount of stuff that is done within GP systems in the UK now, it just would not be possible. So it's, but in practice, when people have tried to do research to evidence that, it's actually really hard to do. Um, so yeah, in theory, absolutely we should. Is it, is it something that lends itself to that kind of research? Not sure, in, in the academic sense. But I would, I would say demonstration, demonstrating what we've got today is the start of that. Just to be clear, yeah. as a scientist, mm. you know, we, we, our, the, our trials, the applications that we evaluate, tend to be small scale. They're kind of upstream. They're not actually deployed in office. We have a number of, of cases, and other people mm. have built applications that are large scale. Um, but they're all very, very focused, and the thing is designed from mm. scratch for doing a trial, for, sure. you know, which is yeah. the, the currency of, of medical science. Mm. Um, you know, I absolutely understand that it's incredibly difficult to kind of produce objective evidence if you're really just doing it within, within a deployed deployment situation mm. in a real practical working hospital or clinic. But sh do you think that you're missing a trick and you should be spending some time you know, trying to kind of do studies which specifically look at questions and, and show that yeah. there's benefit. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I don't know anybody else got any thoughts on that. Uh, I want to take a step back, almost lift it up a level, because I think one of the, the great things about open air is that it is 
so much more interoperable with other new technologies. And there's a, a growing evidence base of this alternate model of care that open air can support. So for instance, Samsung have, oh, they've spun it off now, but they developed a portable and disposable ECG monitor called the S-Patch. Not sure if anyone's heard of it. Um, they did a trial with Kaiser and they actually proved that they could uh, eliminate readmission after acute cardiac surgery. So the readmission beforehand was between 30 to 40 percent. And then using this device, portable device, and the accompanying software, um, they could actually stop that population from being readmitted. Um, now that, the data that's generated from that device can't be incorporated with Epic or Cerner data just because of the, the fundamental data model. And so I think, I mean, yes, the point that a greater focus on an evidence base and building that evidence base is there. I think also expanding to incorporate this other evidence that is indirectly supporting the case as well. The other point is, I think it's it's really tricky with, with the EHR benefits realisation case because it really depends on your starting point. So the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne implemented EPIC a few years ago and they've just published that their mortality rate went down by 20%. And you've got to think, well, what were they doing, you know, <laughs> before they had this EMR? Because it's probably not the EMR. It, pro it probably was just that everyone had to take a, a think about what their processes were, document them so that they could be digitised, and that was actually the thing that led to the benefit, not this sort of clunky software. Anyway, I think lots of things to think about. Um, but, yeah, thank you for the question. Tom? It's just to add a little bit to that, to John's original um, thing. I don't know about academic studies. They're hard to do and, you know, but uh, now I've got Rob Tweet sitting next to me. He's created a whole stack of uh, software which is designed to uh, and has successfully made it easy to build applications. Pablo Pazos in Uruguay can build an application in 20 minutes um, or an hour or something like that. You know, Ian, I've seen Ian do, and other people up there do it various times. Uh, one of the things that the community does, and I'm a million miles away from this, I'm just kind of observing from the outside because I don't build applications. Uh, one, of the one of the things that the community could do much better is to get uh, hold of that experience and, you know, in very pragmatic ways, videos and all the usual kinds of things and hack days and blah, 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 and show people, yes, it, it, even though open air is built to be a kind of you know, quite serious long-term whole of uh, patient lifetime health record and, you know, scalable to whole countries, actually you can build an application, especially from an existing template or a bunch of archetypes. You could start with some archetypes, build a 20 data point template in the first half hour and probably have something running in the screen in the next, you know, hour or something like that. Now, nobody really builds industrial strength applications like that. You're going to spend a little bit more, more time than 90 minutes. But the fact that you can do anything in 90 minutes, and you know, as we all know, that's the kind of modern requirement. If you can't do anything in you know, an hour or two hours or some hack day kind of length of time, hopefully before the next coffee break or whatever, you're kind of dead. Which for old style you know, engineers like me, I just think, well, okay, but, um, I might just go and take up market gardening because <laughs> that's a really weird world we're living in. But nevertheless, the, the reality is that certain technologies have brought us to the uh, you know, brought the capabilities that have enabled us to actually do that. And you, you know, some of the things that we've done in open air have helped that, I think, you know, being able to build clinical models and just press a button and generate a format that can be used. And then somebody else has a nice big stack of stuff that can consume it and maybe generate a, a decent form. So Miranda's, you know, historically had a um, pretty decent form builder uh, and other companies have got similar kinds of things. So we've been, not very good as a community in kind of pulling that together and, and showing it. And, you know, it's not for me to even say how we should improve that, but clearly we should do better and probably people in this room or elsewhere might have good ideas on how we can uh, bring that uh, more, make it more visible. And I suppose in the NHS environment, presence at hack days would be one way of doing that. Um, you know, I'm sure there could be... I don't know whether you have any comments, Rob, on... Yeah, I've, 
um, for quite a long time been of the view that there's actually a, an interesting potential approach to breaking this problem of how do you get stuff like open air accepted. Um, and that's to, to go for what I, I, I would kind of describe it as the, the missing scale on Smog's, Smog the Dragon's armor. And, and, and that is the two-pronged thing. It's these hack days, which are always um, very well attended and lots of um, very enthusiastic clinicians and developers come along and will create interesting solutions, which as soon as the event is finished, they just wither and die. And they're all always created using whatever the pet technology was that the developers knew and liked using and so on. And the other area has been mentioned before. There's, there's a phrase I like uh, to describe them, uh, which is feral systems. These are the, the, those many hundreds, potentially more systems that a typical hospital will have that have been purchased you know, along the way by consultants or, or whatever with a bit of spare cash that they have, which always slip under the radar, which then become the bane of the IT department's life, which is how do you then uh, in, uh, integrate them. Um, and those aren't going to go away, in my opinion. So what I decided to do was to create this platform called the CUDE HIT platform. It's all open source. With a view to making that available to both of those um, uh, sectors. So an application gets developed in, in a hack day based on this with open air as one of the key components of it. And it can, because it's then using a potentially enterprise grade platform underneath it won't necessarily wither on the vine. It can be extended. It can be turned into a system that then can be bought and implemented as a feral system. But now you're starting to build a standardization of feral systems, all under the radar. And before long, someone in the ID department says, hang on. We keep integrating these systems, and they're all using the same open EHR underneath them. Nice. And we know how to integrate that. And there you are. You've, you've shot smog right through the missing scale. Thanks, Thanks Rob. I'm just, I'm just conscious of time, because we're just running over slightly. Any last quick thoughts or comments? Or do we want beer? <laughs> I'm not answering that, by the way. In that case, I'm just going to say thank you to our panel. Um, I'll also say thank you to all of you for attending. And actually, there's still a heck of a lot of people here, which is amazing at five past five. Uh, so thank you for coming along. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'd also like to say thanks to our AV guys, who've done a great job swapping between different headsets <laughs> and machines. And finally, to Yaka and his team uh, at Better, who largely put this together and did all the hard work of, of, of making it happen. So thanks to these guys as well. Thank you. <laughs>